In today's tutorial, we're going to be creating this particular sci-fi looping animation. We're going to be using geometry proximity and we're going to try and keep it really simple. So let's figure out how we can create this. In our default scene, we're going to bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to create a new window and we'll change it from the 3D viewport to the geometry node editor. Then we'll press this plus button to create a new geometry node tree, zoom in, select the group input and tap X to delete it. Now the main effect is going to happen on a cylinder with spheres instance on it. So to create the cylinder, we can simply search for a cylinder node and plug that into the group output. Now once we do this, we see that the cylinder is on the wrong axis because we want it to actually be either on the y axis or on the x axis. So to get this rotated on to the x axis, we have to rotate it about the y axis by 90 degrees. So to rotate cylinder or any object in geometry nodes, we can search for a transform geometry node and plug that after the cylinder. Now we're going to change the rotation on the y-axis by 90 and we have a cylinder pointed in the right direction. Next, we need to make the cylinder much longer. So we'll change the depth to something like 10 so that we get five units on the left-hand side and five units on the right-hand side. But I also feel like the cylinder is way too fat. So I'm gonna actually change the radius down to 0.5. And with that, I don't want this many segments to be present. So I'll change the vertices from 32 down to something like 16. Beyond that, if we actually switch on wireframe view, we see that we don't have any vertices present in the middle, but we require vertices to be present for us to instance spheres in a grid-like pattern. So to add in more vertices, we can just increase this side segment all the way till we make each of these look approximately like a square. So we'll press one to go into the front view and we'll zoom in close to the x-axis so that we can actually see the side segments and we'll change this segment count until they look fairly square. So I think at a value of 50, they're approximately square. Remember when you're actually looking at this, you should look as close as possible to the x-axis. So either this box or this box or any of these, and you shouldn't go Go too far away because there's going to be stretching as we go away from the x-axis due to the nature of 3d objects however once you're set with that we need to instance some spheres onto these points so i'll search for an instance on points node and plug that in after the transform geometry for the instance i'm going to use an icosphere with subdivisions as I feel like. So I'll take an icosphere and I'll change the radius down to something like 0.1 and I'll increase the subdivisions to 2 and plug the mesh into the instance of the instance on points. Now to actually see this icosphere properly I'll switch back to my solid view and this is what we have. I think a subdivision of 2 is too less. So I'll increase the subdivisions to 3. Now this looks like a fairly well packed cylinder. If the packing wasn't nice I'd have to play around with the radius value till we get non-overlapping and non-spacious spheres just so that it seems like they're just about touching. Now now that we have these, we need to actually move these radially outward from the cylinder. So to move anything in geometry nodes, we use a set position node. So let's search for a set position and plug that in after the instance on points. Now, if we play around with the offset, we would be able to get them to move radially outward, but we have to think about which direction is radially outward. If we actually look at the position of every single one of these points, we'll see that we have an arrow or a vector that goes from the origin to the point. However, if we were to ignore the value on the X axis, we get a vector that points radially outward. Hopefully that was understandable, but let's just take a look at that by using a position node, which gives us the position of every single sphere. And if we plug the position into the offset, they all move out. But the actual length of the cylinder has also increased, which we can see by just removing the connection. And that's because the points at this edge also move out even further towards that edge. So to ignore the x-axis, we can simply search for a vector math node, plug the position into the first vector. And for the second vector, we'll keep zero on the x-axis and change the y and the z to one. And now when we plug this into the offset, we still see movement because this is not supposed to be add. We're supposed to change this from add to multiply so that it gets multiplied by zero on the x-axis and it moves only on the y and the z axis. So that way you see without the position node, it's smaller. And once we add in the position node, all of them move out radially without moving on the x-axis. So this is essentially the main setup that we want, but we need to control when these particles actually move. So for that, we could use the same vector multiply node, but we have to make sure that whatever we multiply it by has a value of zero on the x-axis. So we're going to do this by searching for the proximity of each of these points with some other object or a point. So we'll search for a points node, which will set up one single point for us. And we need to find the proximity of each of these points through this point. For that, we search for a proximity node, which is called the geometry proximity. And we plug this geometry from the points into the target. For the source position, we need the position of every single one of these points. So we search for a position node, which will iterate through the position 
position of every single point. Now, once we plug this in, we can change this from faces to points. And now we have the distance of every single point from the original or new point that we created. Now we need to be able to move this new point. So we'll press shift A and search for a set position node and plug that in right after this points. And now let's take this distance and use it to actually move these points away. So to move the points away, we search for a combined X, Y, Z node and we'll keep the X value at zero. And let's initially just take the distance on the Y and the Z to be this particular distance and then plug this into the vector output. Now what we get is the exact inverse of the effect that we want because where the point is, the value is zero and where the point isn't present, the further we go, the greater the value becomes. And now if we move the point using the set position node, so we can move it on the X axis, you can see the type of animation that we get. Now to invert this, there are many ways or techniques that we could use, but the one that I'll use today is searching for a math node and we'll change this from add to divide and we'll divide one by whatever value we get as the distance. So let's plug the distance into these two sockets and plug this value into the Y and the Z. By doing this, we get, oh, sorry, we need to plug the distance into the second value so that we get one divided by the distance and we plug that into the Y and the Z. So by doing this, we get one divided by the distance, which means the larger the distance, the smaller the value will be. The smaller the distance, the larger the value will be. But we don't quite see much of a difference. So to enhance this effect, we have to scale it up by searching for another vector math node and changing the type from add to scale. And now we can scale it up or scale it down according to our needs. Apart from that, we can also scale it by negative values to get this sort of a really cool effect, which is what I think I'll actually go with at the end. Beyond that, to get some more control over this fall off, we can search for another math node or duplicate this divide node. And instead of keeping it at divide, we can change this to power. And that way we can control the actual fall off as you can see by just changing this exponent value. I'll keep the exponent value at something like 0 0.6. And I think that looks good enough. Now we have a single point here, but we need some object to also be present there. So what I'll do is I'll press shift A and search for whatever object I want. So I'll use a UV sphere for this animation and I'll press control two to add in a subdivision surface of level two. Next, I'll press S 0.6 to just make it slightly smaller. And now I'll select my original geometry node object again, take the sphere from the outliner and drag it into my geometry node editor. Now for this set position of the points, I can actually just take the location of this sphere that I just created and plug that into the position. Apart from that, I have to make sure that I choose relative and I change the offset to zero on all the axes. Now, when I take the sphere and move the sphere around, you can see how the effect follows along, which is exactly what I want. Now, the reason why I didn't directly use the location of the sphere over here, because we do have the geometry and we can directly plug this into the target is because this does not always give you the exact effect that you want. If we were to take this sphere and scale it up, you can see how we get really large values towards the actual edges of the sphere and the center of the sphere goes back to a value of zero. And that's why we get two spikes instead of one. And that's not what we want. So a way to avoid that so that we can use any shape that we want later on as well is by using a point and setting the point equal to the location of whatever object we want. So now we can plug this into the target and the effect will be independent of the scale of the object or the shape of the object or anything like that. Anyway, once we have the object, we can go about setting our defaults and materials. So let's go to our render properties, switch on ambient occlusion, bloom and screen space reflections. We can always play around with the ambient occlusion settings such as the distance and everything later on, but those are up to you to actually play around with and experiment. If we switch our viewport shading to rendered, we can actually see the differences that this makes. So you can see how changing the value from the default 0.2 to a value of five increases the ambient occlusion and we can increase the factor as well beyond one, just make everything a lot darker. Once we have all of these checked, we can go to our output properties, change the frame rate to 30 frames per second and frame we're going to keep at 150 so that it's a five second long animation. Output folder can be wherever you want it to be. File format, I'm going to choose FFmpeg video. And for the encoding, I'm going to change the container to MPEG4 and keep the output quality as perceptually lossless. Then I'm going to actually set the materials and make this smooth. So I'll go back to my geometry node tree, shift the group output to the side, search for a set shade smooth node, as well as a set material node, and just plug those in one after the other. Then for the set material node, I'm going to actually have to choose the material as the default material itself. And with that, we can actually start shading the material. So let's switch from the geometry node editor to the shader editor. And for the material, let's go ahead and just make it much more metallic and give it a slightly bluish tint. Then for the world background, we can change it to a brighter white so that we get really nice ambient occlusion, but we don't necessarily want the background to be seen as white. 
So I'll switch my shader editor from object to world and I'll press shift A search for a background node again and mix these two using a mix shader. So I'll search for a mix shader, plug the second background into the second socket and then search for a light path node and take the is camera ray and plug that into the factor. Now for the second background color, I'll just change that to a dark black and there we have it. Next for the actual sphere, I'll go ahead and click object shade smooth and then I'll go back to the object tab in the shader editor and press this new button to create a new material after which I'll just make this emissive and maybe an emissive blue will do and for the emission strength I can crank it up to something like 100 and because the bloom becomes way too much I'll go to my bloom settings over here decrease the intensity down to 0 0.02 and maybe clamp it at something like 20. Apart from that if you want to give some more depth to this sphere you can always search for a layer weight node as well as a math node and then use this facing value the blend value as well as the math value value changed to multiply to actually control the strength of the emission. Since we had the emission strength at something like 100, I'll change the multiply value to 100 as well. And now by playing around with the blend value, you actually see some differences. Beyond that, I'll make this completely metallic and I'll reduce the roughness as well. And I'll make the base color far darker. And I think that looks good enough. Maybe I'll increase the value even more. And if you're still not getting what you want, you can always search for a color ramp and plug that in between the layer weight and the multiply nodes to actually bring in the colors according to what you feel is necessary. So once you're done with that, you can start off the actual animation for which you'll have to set up the camera. So let's select the camera, press Alt G to clear location, Alt R to clear rotation, and then you can press R X 90 to rotate it on the X axis by 90 degrees. Then you can press G Y to just move it back and then press zero to go into your camera view. Next, we'll expand our timeline by a little bit. Press the back arrow to go to frame zero, bring your cursor to the 3D viewport and then tap I location to add in a keyframe for the location. Then you can go to frame 150 and then just press G X followed by the length of the cylinder that you made. Remember, we made it 10 units. So I'll just tap 10 and then tap I location. Then I'll come down to the timeline and press T linear to make the camera into a smooth loop. But I also require the sphere to move with my camera. So I'll select the sphere, then shift select the camera and press control P set parent to object. And now the sphere moves with the camera. Next to have this not just abruptly end over here, I'm going to go ahead and select it followed by pressing one to go to the front view. And then I'll press alt D to create a linked duplicate X to move it only on the X axis and just bring it till it perfectly aligns up with the previous one. And once you're happy with that, you should get a perfectly seamless loop. To make sure that it's perfectly seamless. Frame number 150 and frame number zero should be the exact same. So as long as they're looking the exact same, you're going to get a perfectly seamless loop. So once you're done with all of that, you might face one issue, which is we still have our default light switched on, which is why there is a slight difference in the reflection between frame zero and frame 150, because at frame zero, the light is towards the right. So the reflections are towards the right. And at frame 150, the light goes towards the left. So the reflections are towards the left. So to fix that, we can actually go to frame zero, select our light, and then control select the camera and press control P set parent to object. Now the light moves with the camera. And so you'll get a perfectly seamless loop. Once you're happy with all of that, you can go ahead and press render animation. Of course, there are a lot of other ways to actually render this out. You could make this far more sci-fi by making more emissive objects. You could make this completely abstract by changing these spheres into maybe some sort of a marble or concrete material. And you could keep the background as an HDRI or many other things. So creativity is completely up to you. And the aim of these tutorials are just to teach you a technique that you can apply in in many other scenarios. So if you like this one, be sure to check out other tutorials on my channel because I release a video every single day and there are over 150 tutorials present on my channel waiting for you to watch. Until the next video comes out, thank you so much for watching, keep creating and stay creative.